In many regard, the U.S. political system isn't all that different from Canada. And when you think about it, it's rather logical, right? Both countries are very large country geographically with a lot of subcultures inside a country. We both take a lot of our institution from Great Britain, who uh, was a colonial power who occupied both country at a point in time. However, um, there's a lot of key differences between the Canada and the US. And the point of this presentation is just to give you a broader context as to what are the commonality and what are the differences so you can have some context during election night in a few uh, weeks from now or just looking at the news these days. So the three branches of the of government, uh, the legislative branch, the US has the same uh, governmental branch in Canada, legislative, executive, and the judiciary. The legislative, first you have the House of Representatives. It's exactly like our Houses of Common, except for one key difference is we are only elected, we only elect them every four year, normally sometimes five years, sometimes less. The US, it's always every two years. And like us, both at the federal level or at the state or, or at the state level, they have these houses of they, they have like or equivalent of le, the legislative assemblies as well. Um, and the idea here is the House of Representatives in the US are meant to be like a fast reaction to kind of always represent where the public is at any point in time in terms of public opinion. Then you have the Senate. That's a place where the US is drastically different from Canada. First of all, unlike Canada, the U.S. is actually, the U.S. Senate actually has a lot of power because U.S. Senators are elected by the people, which get them far more legitimacy to actually exert the power they have theoretically. At a federal level, there's two senators per state, and it varies at state level. Essentially, like the U.S., when you look at state level, there's always, there's, there's some oddities for every specific state, right? So there's always some exception. I'm just trying to give the broad trend as much as possible. Um, but generally, you have the same principle of ensuring regional representation for every state. Like it's kind of the House of Representative, like the House of Common in Canada is meant to be representative of population, while um, the Senate is meant to always kind of ensure an equality between the region. And to pass a bill need to pass both the House of Representative and the Senate. Uh, that create a situation where, unlike Canada, rural uh, areas have a lot more political clout, especially since uh, the U.S. Senate has something that they call the filibuster. And the filibuster means if in the federal Senate you need at least 60 seats to close a debate. So essentially a party that is in the minority in the US Senate can essentially drag a debate for a very, very long time. Um, and that means that theoretically, at the very least, you need some kind of bipartisan support to have a broad level of support for a specific bill to make sure it actually goes through the process. Um, and the fact that it's not the case, often these days is responsible for a lot of the gridlock you see in the US, a lot of the fact that with both parties at loggerhead, it's very hard to get anything done. Um, in general, you could see like in Canada, for example, like you'd see say the Liberals or the Conservative voting as a bloc in the House of, in the House of Common more, than, um, more often than not. Well, in the US, it's not a case. Obviously, Republican and Democrat tend to vote alongside um, the, the people from their parties, but a single um, representative or a single senators has a lot more autonomy compared to uh, compared to Canada. So you often have people from one party trying to, oh, maybe this member from the other party can be convinced to vote on our side on this bill, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more interaction in that regard. The executive. Uh, the governors take up them as the equivalent of um, our provincial premiers. They're elected by direct vote. So they're the, um, the person who is in charge of a state, so to speak, unlike in Canada on a provincial level, is not necessarily the person who has the most seats at the House of, in the House of Representatives or in the Senate, right? It's completely separate. They're elected by, uh, by a direct vote, like say um, 
the Republican candidate for governor will have 49%, Democrat will get 47, but the Democrat may have a majority in the House of Representatives or the Senate of their state. So essentially you can have that division, which never happened in Canada. That's why you see things like governmental lockdowns like we saw during the last years. The president, oh, that's where it's getting fun. You're elected by a thing called the Electoral College. And to make it as simple as possible, the Electoral College essentially give each state a certain number of points. And that number of points is equal to the number of senators they have, plus the number of people they have in the House of Representatives. So for example, Wyoming is a fairly small state. They have one representative and two senators. They're gonna, they're gonna have three points. Well, California, for example, they have two senators too, but they have 53 representative in the House of Representatives. So they're worth 55 points. And most of these states work on a winner takes all basis. Like say in Florida, for example, which is one state that's often very, very close. Doesn't matter if the Democrat win by 55% or it's the Republican winning by 52%. If you are the party who have the most vote in a single state, you get all the electoral vote. So as, you, as I'm sure you can imagine, it creates a situation where essentially to be president, you go for a few states that are really key to win. Like for example, it's not worth for a Democrat to go to Wyoming. They haven't won that state since 50 years. Same thing for a Republican in Massachusetts. They have won it once since the 1950s, for example. So what it does, what it creates is the so-called swing states. They're concentrated on a few key areas in the country. Like you can see here, in red are the states that can be relied to generally vote Republican, in blue those who can be relied to vote for the Democrats, and in purple you have the, those states who are kind of in the middle where the battleground is made. Texas, some people think they're there at this election, some people think they're not, so that's why I put like a question mark in. And it's a very big state, so it's very important to how it's going to turn out. Uh, oh. And uh, the governor and the president also have a veto on all laws. So that introduces another wrinkle, which, but that veto can be overridden if you have two thirds of both Senate and House who want to override the vetoes. So that complicate the process of getting a law through for, and create more situation where you need a very broad level of support for a bill for it to eventually happen. The judiciary. Um, in many regards, the, uh, the judicial system in the US is very, like Canada, with one key difference is for federal judges after a certain level, including the Supreme Court, the Senate need to confirm the judge. They're named by the president, they nominate them, but the Senate need to vote and approve them. So that creates essentially a situation where, unlike Canada, where um, a lot of politicos in Canada might very well go years without even taking much about uh, the specific politics about the Supreme Court justice. Every time there's a seat open in the Supreme Court, like we see these days with uh, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, it, it's a big political question, very partisan. The other, the last key uh, element in the U.S. that make it very different, and it's one of the reasons why there's a lot less of a party lines, are the primaries. Like, for example, in Canada, if you want to be candidate or the leader of a party, you're generally voted by party members, right? Not in the US. In the US, they have what they call primaries, which is you don't need to be a member of the Democratic or the Republican Party. You just have to declare yourself, I'm a supporter. And on one day, they're going to have this first round of elections, so to speak, inside a party. And you're going to go and vote, I want this person to be the candidate of my party to this specific seat. So you can appeal to essentially the for your base, the, the, the average supporters from your party far more than somebody who would like to be a candidate in Canada for a party might do. And that, that obviously um, make a big difference. Like for example, in 2008, Clinton had the support from most of the elites of the Democratic Party, but Obama managed to appeal to your average Democratic supporter more and that's why he became the Democratic candidate and eventually the president. And there's another example of that, like Kennedy, also, uh, for example, back in the days, became the candidate and eventually the president through appealing to your average party supporter versus the party elites. Finally, you've got the impeachment. Essentially, um, oh, 
if somebody uh, has committed an act that a lot of people don't like inside a political system in the executive branch, like for example, the president or a judge of the Supreme Court, you need, um, you can bring that person to trial to the Senate either of the state or at a federal level. And if two thirds of the people, of the senators vote to convict that person, that person will be destituted from their position. Um, on a presidential level, it only happened four times. Uh, the most recent time was when the Democratic tried, uh, when the Democrat tried unsuccessfully to impeach Trump about one year ago. So questions either on the U.S. political system or, generally speaking, current events in the U.S., the election and all. <laughs>